teacher, scholar, leader, and gentleman of high degree, a truly uncommon man. These words recently were chosen to describe Frederick Emmons Terman, a man whose contributions to education, science, technology, and industry are incalculable. Dr. Terman's commitment to his work and his belief in the development of people and ideas have made the Silicon Valley area in California one of the technology centers of the world. This is a portrait of a pioneer. When one has been around uh, and involved in as many things as I have, one inevitably collects a, uh, a, leaves a string of mementos behind. And this uh, uh, display case illustrates that. This Over the decades, Fred uh, Terman's pioneering work and accomplishments have won recognition from governments, educational institutions, and others around the world. He has been honored by several United States presidents for his scientific work in peace and war. Dr. Terman's contributions to Stanford University as teacher, researcher, and administrator have been credited with helping that institution gain its prominent place in American education. And his early understanding of the need for a close relationship between academia and industry has been praised for having helped create the world's foremost center of innovative technology, the Bay Area's Silicon Valley. How did one man achieve so much and pioneer so many areas? The answer may lie in Fred Terman's remarkable childhood. Born in the small town of English, Indiana in 1900, young Fred spent his early years under the tutelage of his father, a brilliant young psychologist, Louis M. Terman. This gifted scientist, who later would go on to develop the world-famous Stanford Binet Intelligence Quotient, did not send his son to school until the boy was nine. Instead, young Fred was encouraged to pursue his own interests freely. And when the family moved to Stanford University in 1910, Fred spent his early teens roaming the hills of the campus, fishing for bass in Felt Lake, and learning to swim in Lake Lagunita. At age 14, Terman became a radio ham, an interest which led him to study electrical engineering at Stanford, and in 1924, received his doctorate from MIT. After returning to California and suffering a serious case of tuberculosis that would always affect him, Fred Terman continued his career at Stanford University, a career that would include teaching and writing such classics as Radio Engineering and the Radio Engineer's Handbook. Well, I saw an opportunity. Um, the first year I taught only half time, and when I got to the spring quarter, of that year, there wasn't anything, there wasn't any obvious course that I needed to teach, so I suggested that I teach a course in uh, radio engineering, be like called electronics today, and uh, 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 which I did, and this was quite successful, and re repeated this course uh, for the next uh, several years. One of the problems, however, was that there wasn't really a satisfactory textbook. A lot of the material that I put on the board for the students uh, I had to write out and they had to copy. And it wasn't really a, 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 a good textbook. And around 1929 or 30, uh, the McGraw-Hill traveling man represented, covered the West Coast, uh, Curtis Benjamin, who later became president of McGraw-Hill, uh, was talking with me and I was complaining about uh, this situation. He says, well, why don't you write a book? Uh, kind you're talking about. And he got the president of McGraw-Hill to write a follow-up letter uh, urging me to do this, and I decided to undertake the task. Oh, I hadn't thought about it at all before. And that, uh, for, so for the next couple of years, that took a bit of my time, and that resulted in this, in this book, which was published, actually, came in the hands of the public in 1932, taking about two years or a little over to write it. 
This book was very successful. It, it uh, hit the market just right and did what I was hoping to do. And uh, it was immediately picked up by places like MIT and Illinois and Berkeley and Caltech and so on, used as their standard textbook for seniors and beginning graduate students. Two of the students who used Dr. Terman's book were his sons, Louis and Fred Jr., two of the three sons born to Fred and Sybil Terman. I took his course the year after he stopped teaching it, so I, I didn't get the benefit of his teaching directly, but I did get the, the book. And uh, I think people who have read that book will, will remark that it's a marvelous book because it's written so densely. Every sentence means something. There's nothing really wasted in that book. And uh, I remember reading through the book, sometimes not understanding, being able to go back, ask him uh, about questions about the book. And uh, he was quite willing to discuss it. And sometimes I'd really not quite agree with what he said. And we would discuss it. And most of the time, he was right, unfortunately. My father at that time was dean of engineering. And I uh, was majoring in engineering, uh, engineering science. I uh, did take one one-year course, the, the famous uh, course that used Terman's radio engineering. Uh, at, at that time, in one year, you learned everything there was about radio engineering, uh, all of which was in the book. And uh, it was a good course. It was a great course. Uh, he um, had a, a way of transmitting his enthusiasm for the subject to the students that I, was quite unique. Uh, there's very few other teachers I've had who come, even came close to that sort of indescribable uh, enthusiasm that makes a college course interesting. And um, the, the whatever it is that you get out of having a lecture that you don't get out of just reading the book. Fred Terman's influence as a writer and teacher has been enormous, and he has been gifted with the ability to identify brilliant students and launch them on successful careers. His commitment to ending the brain drain to the East Coast and to creating a new and vital center of creative innovation has proven one of his central contributions. Men like Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett Founders of one of the world's most successful electronics companies acknowledge their debt to their remarkable teacher. Well, I've often thought that probably one of the most important things that happened as far as I was concerned, I guess as far as Bill and I both are concerned, is uh, meeting uh, Dr. Terman. I used to go up to the ham radio shack there, which is in the same building as, as the electronics laboratory. And as I remember, it was during my junior year that I used to see you now and then. And uh, I remember that, uh, that you knew what I was doing in athletics and you checked on my grade. You knew, all, you knew a whole lot about me. But well, uh, uh, in any case, it was uh, the fact that you asked, gave me the opportunity to take that course in radio engineering when I was a senior, I think was a very important turning point as far as my career is concerned. Of fact, that whole career is as far as I was concerned, I didn't know a vacuum tube from a peanut. And uh, I graduated, and then I heard that there was this very interesting professor who was teaching radio engineering, and I decided it was, I really ought to see if I could take some courses from him. Uh, Fred gave us a lot of encouragement, as I remember saying somewhere along the line, that. Uh, there have been many electronic businesses started by people without very much education or uh, background, and that uh, there should be a good opportunity for someone who had a, a good education in electronics to start a business and, be, and become successful. So Fred gave us a lot of encouragement uh, during the, the latter part of our senior year. This encouragement later took a very concrete form when Fred Terman helped young Hewlett and Packard begin their new enterprise. Well, you still had the idea that yes. someday you'd like to get into business together. And this idea of negative feedback turned up in the journal, the concept of negative feedback. And I got kind of excited about it because I could see that this had a, a lot of implications. One of the, in the article that was published by, originated with Jim Ray. Well, the feedback idea originated with um, Black. 
that black of the Bell Labs. But General Radio had some applications of it. Yes. And uh, one of them was an oscillator that you pushed buttons and got different frequencies. And I looked at that and said, well, that's fine, except that you, what you need is a variable frequency, continuously variable. And maybe we can make that with compounds that you can buy and they're inexpensive. And um, uh, you or I checked that out and it, it, it worked all right. But the, the missing, the thing that's needed to make it a success was something that would control the amplitude of the audio waves without distorting them or putting in harmonics. And you came up with the very brilliant suggestion of the little lamp. And that made it, that's what made it go. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the key, because this thing, General Radio had this push button thing, which made it limited usefulness, because it only worked for a limited number of frequencies. And um, with this lamp in there, you could get a continuous variation in tone, just up to a half a cycle if you wanted to. And uh, Bill thought that one up, and uh, I guess you got a patent on it. Yes. I think we, oh, we, I think we, I had a deal with it &T by which you, we were able to get a patent without any expense. That, that was another area in which you helped, Fred. You got it &T interested, and they bought the foreign patent rights for $500 and agreed to get our, the U.S. patent for us. So that <laughs> doubled our capital and gave us a patent. <laughs> Those were the depression years, and uh, we used to build a laboratory apparatus because we couldn't afford to buy the apparatus that was available on the market. And, uh, and this here was an inexpensive um, audio oscillator, which is something that we like to have several of around the laboratory. And Bill was just working out this one point and made it a practical device. I thought they were ready to start a company in Packard uh, was in Schenectady and, and you didn't jump on an airplane and fly across the country in those depression days. And, uh, and I had a, came into a thousand dollars. This is a well-known story over here. I, I came into a thousand dollars and uh, for, for a little research project, a special job, and it just happened that Packard had the excellent experience for this. And I went to Hewlett and said, do you think, it, do you think we could get Packard out here if we were offering $500 for nine months as a half-time research assistant to work on this project? The other $500 would be for materials. And this, he could take a leave of absence from General Electric then and uh, would not have to resign. He was doing famously at General Electric and jobs were scarce during the Depression and uh, Packard had just gotten married, and he didn't want to give up a good job, and so on. But he could do he could do this stunt. Look, he over, and he might lose a little time in GE, but he wouldn't. He was still could go back to GE if if need be. And uh, Hill says, "Well, I don't know, but I'll find out." Well, I found out Packard was it. He wrote it, Packard, and Packard uh, was interested, and so he uh, came out here. And the rest is history. Thanks to Fred Turman's personal involvement, men like Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, Charlie Litton, Dean Watkins, and Russ Varian helped create an entire new industry. Fred Turman's enormous energy and talent was also harnessed in defense of freedom. During World War II, the young scientist was called upon to form a research laboratory dedicated to developing countermeasures against enemy radar. The lab was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was credited with saving thousands and thousands of American and allied lives. And I started with a one-man staff, me, myself, and, uh, and I was given the ground rule that not to recruit anyone who was already in the war effort. I couldn't go around to the other war projects and recruit some of my friends who had been glad to work for me, except that they were already in the war. And uh, so I had to start with inexperienced people 
and sort of from around. Well, we built that laboratory up and so that in two and a half years we had some 850 people in it. And uh, we uh, uh, built, uh, created uh, jammers to jam the enemy radar. We developed something that's a technique for making very narrow aluminum strips about so long that were just the right uh, character to disturb the German radar and put in spurious signals that would look like radar but uh, weren't radar. Dr. Terman's encyclopedic mastery of his field was partly due to his thoroughness and attention to detail. His colleagues and family had long been impressed with his incredible ability to organize facts. His secretary during the war years remembers... It's awfully hard to summarize a, a complex personality that you've known over a long period of time, but to me the outstanding qualities probably would be a rational person and beyond that a reasonable person. There's a little difference between the two, I think. He was reasonable in his expectations. He was rational in his explanations and his, his motivations, it seemed to me. But he was also a very kind person and very patient as long as he thought that you were really trying to do the job that ought to be done. I, I have a feeling that he could be impatient if he felt people just weren't, weren't really trying to do the job. But those were the outstanding characteristics that made it very easy and a pleasure to work for him. The, the key thing that I'm sure everybody's told you about Dad is that he, he's always had this very strong drive and, and organization ability and uh, has always done his done everything as, as um, thoroughly as possible and you know, never settled for second best or second effort if, if he could get the best. After the war, Fred Terman returned to his old home, Stanford University. In the years to come, he would serve as Dean of Engineering, Provost, and Vice President. His vision was to create a university dedicated to excellence. But how did he go about turning this ideal into a reality? I have a theory uh, on uh, how you build excellence, is that you do it by building steeples of excellence in a faculty. You take some things, topics that are of, of first-rate importance, and you uh, make them be, be strong, very good in them. But you don't have any of these. You don't have to build very many steeples. But ones that you do build, you want to make very good and push them very high. You don't have to have a lot of faculty members in a steeple, two or three really good ones. See, it doesn't matter of massive numbers in the faculty. It's, 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 it's who they are, not how many they are. Fred Terman's commitment to excellence compelled him to seek the most gifted and talented individuals, professors and students, and bring them home to Stanford. But he contributed to the university in other profound ways, too. It was Fred Terman who understood the new post-World War II relationship between government and university laboratories, and who used that knowledge to help Stanford grow and mature. It was Fred Terman who was sensitive to the needs of industry and rallied its support in exchange for the university's unique resources. In turn, Stanford dedicated this engineering facility to Fred Terman. Today, his brainchild, Stanford Industrial Park, stands as a testament to Fred Terman's vision. Indeed, the entire Silicon Valley center of American technological innovation owes much to his many decades of pioneering leadership. Looking back over a career that spans more than 60 years, Frederick Emmons Terman has much to be proud of. As he said himself not so long ago, if I could relive my life, I believe I couldn't do better than to play the same record over again. <laughs>